Welcome to the Cure Church Nashville. Glad you stopped by. Let's go take a look inside.
over us, that watch over us, that our leaders and so forth. So I encourage you just to think about that and take a moment. So, Father, I pray today, God, 
I come together, Father, and ask you, Lord, for the wisdom that you have that the Holy Spirit can bring. And give that, Lord God, give the wisdom not only to us as leaders over our homes, but also to our uh, president and to administration, to the government right now, that they would make the best decisions that help us during this time of crisis. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I, I have a word for you guys today, and uh, it's, it's something that needs to kind of like be brought back to, to remembrance. And I, I remember there was a time in my life where I was just kind of like walking along, and uh, I noticed two Christian guys. Uh, they were actually at the, my front gate, and they were speaking to my brother because my brother had given his life to the Lord at one time. So what the term, what they were doing was it called a follow-up meaning the, uh, my brother had given his life to the Lord, and they had came to our house just to check on him. I mean, it wasn't a phone call back then. It wasn't uh, a text. It wasn't a, uh, you know, an email. It was, it was back in 1989, I believe, where they uh, just came in and just to check on him and just to say, hey, or how are you doing? You know, uh, is there anything we can pray for you for and so forth? And I as I was getting ready to walk out, I had to kind of go through them, through that conversation. And this is something that was I was really afraid to do because it's something I didn't want to partake in. And I always thought to myself, man, that Christianity stuff is for the birds. It's for you. It's not for me. You're using Jesus as a crutch. And here I am. I'm thinking I have my life all together. So as I was walking by, I noticed uh, one of the individuals came up to me and he started trying to hand me a flyer give me a track or or an invitation to church so I started cursing I started you know I, I wanted to give that uh, the appearance like I was unapproachable please don't talk to me I, I want nothing to do with you and he was very persistent today that individual who passed me the flyer today he's my pastor he pastors the cure church in Kansas City but he was very persistent, and he basically made me take that flyer. So I ended up taking the flyer, but it wasn't so much a flyer. It wasn't so much uh, uh, the invitation to church, but he, what he was doing was preaching the gospel. He was telling me that I needed Jesus. His job was to preach the gospel, and he did just that in that short moment, in that short, short interaction that I had with him. And it really, when, I, when we went our separate ways, that really bothered me to the point where I ended up going to church and I ended up uh, seeing him actually at church. And he didn't hold any grudges when I was, you know, when he seen me again. He actually came out and befriended me and he actually blessed my life where he bought me a ticket to go to a Christmas dinner uh, at, at the time I couldn't afford. But I think about with what's going on today. What's going on today in the change in the culture of what's going on in the church atmosphere, in the church world? And nothing's, every, there's change in as far as uh, we're not dressing up, we're not meeting, we're not fellowshipping, we're not hugging on each other. But something that hasn't changed and cannot change, and that is to preach the gospel, preach the word of God. So I want to read a story out of our text, and it's found in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2. And I want you to listen to what's being said. It's Paul the Apostle, who's a teacher, who's kind of like a father figure to his uh, uh, biblical son, Timothy. And what he does is he tells Timothy, uh, he gives him these encouraging words, and sometimes we need these encouraging words just to remind us. And I hope that this would encourage you as a Christian. You are a Christian. God has called you to be a Christian. God has called you to be a witness. Not everybody can, uh, is called to, to, to head up a church, but you are called a witness. And so it says like this in uh, chapter 4, uh, 2 Timothy, verses 1 through 5. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, sound teaching, but have itching ears and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off to myths, or myths, I'm sorry. 
As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. See, in this message, we see Paul was writing to Timothy, his disciple or his son in the faith. And his encouraging words to him was to motivate him and motivate him with what's most important in life. You know, it's to preach the word. See, you might ask, well, what do I mean? Preach the word. I mean, I thought I was already preaching the word. He says, this is very important. And let me tell, explain to you why it's so important. I just want you to pause and think for a moment and ask yourself the way you compare your faith, compare the way you believe, compare your life, like what you have planned today for tomorrow, or compare yourself this morning when you woke up, what was the first thing you thought about? What's, what was the first thing you did? Did you complain or did you praise the Lord? Say, thank you, Jesus. I thank you. I'm talking about your prayer time. I'm talking about your worship time. Even this time you're missing church. Are you still giving to the kingdom of God? What about witnessing? Compare your witnessing and compare all these actions that you're supposed to be doing biblically. Compare it with how Jesus wanted his church to function. My question is, what's the difference? How are you different than what Jesus wanted us to do? Are we caught up as a church? The church of 2020, are we caught up with the unimportant? Motivated by the temporary, inspired by our emotions. In other words, man, we, we say, oh, that was a good service. That was a good church service because, oh, wow, that guy was on fire. And you're only inspired because the, the, the preacher may have been running around the stage and uh, maybe he just said some words that inspired you. Maybe he was just like spitting on the microphone with enthusiasm. And we're, we're inspired temporarily. But as we go on our week, we're going back to the same thing. Maybe we're caught up in the moment, but leave the same, unchanged, going back home to our jobs with no deliverance, no redirection, no sanctification. What makes us different? Have we put on too much focus on the music? Because we have no music, basically no live music anymore. Have we put too much focus on lights? children's ministry, and not focus on God's message. See, when, when Paul told Timothy, he didn't say, hey, go out and make sure you invite people to church. He was telling them, preach, preach, preach. That is your job, is to preach. Preach God's message. In 2 Timothy 3.5, he says, they will if you don't preach God's message, what's going to happen is you're going to have a church, you're going to have a body of Christ, you're going to have a people gather together and feel good, but with no real power. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. See, Paul understood that times will come where people will not want to hear the true gospel. What's the true gospel? It's when, just like I had that interaction with my pastor, I didn't want to hear the truth. The truth was, I needed Jesus, right? The truth was, he wasn't trying to invite me to church. He was trying to invite me to know Jesus Christ. And I didn't want to know that truth. I, I always thought, man, you know, I, I don't need Jesus. I'm okay. If anything, and I would lie to myself, if I'm going to come to church, I don't want to be like those hypocrites. I want to come correct. And Jesus says, no, <laughs> you can't come correct. You have to come to the just the way you are. See, this could be the same for people like you. You call your friends, and they have influence over you. If people have influence over you, and they tell you, oh, you don't have to do this, oh, you don't have to do that, eventually, that's going to rub off on you. What they're trying to do is you call them your friends, and I believe that they're, they're, they're cool people. They're, they're friends with you. But the minute they start lowering the standards of God's teaching, your friends are, are influencing you in the wrong way. See, see, these same, same friends don't want to hear about sacrifice. 
They don't want somebody to preach on sacrifice. It was like, oh, man, he wants more money. Or they don't want to preach on suffering. You know, God tells us that we're supposed to share in his sufferings. Oh, man, that's not the message I want to hear. They don't want to talk about enduring. They don't want to hear a message on forgiveness. Because somewhere along the line, we have this problem in our life. It's like, why is that preacher speaking about forgiveness? Who's talking about me? How does he know? How about this? Most people don't want to hear about bearing each other's burdens or serving each other. And the last thing that they want to know or want to hear is a message about witness. You know that God called everybody to be a witness. See, when I come to church, I want to come to a church that I can be served, that I can feel good. It's like when I'm driving in, I want somebody to wave at me first, right? So I won't look like the idiot waving at them first, right? But that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And then they're going to greet me with a smile. I can have a bad attitude, but I want them to smile. I want to come to a church where I'm forgiven of my sins. I want to be, come to a church where I'm encouraged and I'm told that everything is going to be okay. They turn more to an entertaining gospel, which does not benefit us as an individual or the church or the body of Christ. See, here's the thing. When we go to church, we can get in that position where we want to hear about a testimony, but don't want to be the testimony. We want to hear about a life that was changed, but we don't want God to change our life. We, we as preachers recognize this, and we might even get it twisted. You know, as preachers, I'm encouraging you, if you are a pastor, if you're listening to this, and you preach a church, I don't care if you see your audience rolling their eyes, blinking a little bit more because they're getting tired, you are still called to preach the gospel. Don't steer away from this. It's been said, I heard, I heard it, it's been said, I can't remember. He says, if your one hand is going this way, your other hand better be on the word. Don't be redirected. Don't try to put on a show. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to please the crowd. And don't be afraid to offend somebody. You know, the Bible will offend you. Scripture will offend you. Jesus Christ, he, he didn't come to bring peace, but he came to bring a sword to the point where he's going to separate bone and marrow. He's going to separate families. Don't be afraid to challenge your church. And don't become uh, 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 following them, but you be the example, you as a preacher. See, sometimes, and I get it, here I am, I'm, I'm a I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I'm in it, right? We're more concerned about keeping the crowds engaged and look at our preaching styles to make the word work. Now listen to that. <clears throat> listen to what I said. We as preachers can get it twisted. We're more concerned about keeping the crowds, keeping the crowds engaged and look at our preaching styles to make the word work. We're more concerned about our preaching we think, man, if I preach this way, and I preach that way, and I'm like, oh, yeah, thus says the Lord, and all this stuff, so I can be excited, then the word will work. When in reality, the word makes our preaching work. If we stay focused and preach God's word the way it should be, don't worry about your preaching. Does that make sense? See, if we stay true on point, Focus to the word. The Bible says that it will not return void. To preach means to be a herald. So he said, here, here Paul the Apostle says, look, at, I just need you to be a voice. I need you to be God's voice. If a king would bring an announcement to the land back in those times, he would use men to go out and speak his message. There was no internet. There was no flyers to pass out. There was no commercials, no, no, no skits, no lights, no shows, no tricks. It was an announcement with one authority. It was the authority given by the king. So when Paul told Timothy to preach, he was to preach the message with 
without adding to it, not giving an opinion about it, and to always be about it, in a season and out of, out of it. So to everyone, he had to preach and get the king's message out to all. It didn't matter who you are. It didn't matter if you had, you know, some kind of uh, uh, popularity. The message still needed to be preached. Sometimes we can get it twisted. Sometimes we can get a little intimidated. And we want to talk about more about our church rather than talking about our Lord and Savior of what Jesus has done for me. You know, we, 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 we I, I believe we all have good churches. I, I believe that. If you're telling me that you have come from a good church, by all means, that's fine. You know what I mean? But when was the last time you told somebody about Jesus, what Jesus has done? When was the last time you witness to say, look, this is what Jesus did in my marriage. This is what Jesus done in my life. You know, and we're, we're talking more about the glamour part of it. We're talking about uh, our coffee shop. Oh, we had a great children ministry. You know, we're, 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 hey, don't worry about the parking. You know, you just, uh, you're a visitor. You get to park in the visitor spot. It's really close. Man, I'm telling you, brag about Jesus. Don't brag about your church. Brag about Jesus. Don't worry about the music. Did you know people are fighting today in today's church? about music back in the day who cares about music it's all about jesus the primary goal of the message is to set people free see when the message first came to me this is what the word did i realized i realized that i was lost it wasn't a church that did that for me it was the word of god that did that John 8, 23 and 24 says, He said to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am uh, not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe in me that I am he, he will die in your sins. I am he, you will die in your sins. In other words, I came to the realization that there is a God. And he didn't come from here on earth. He actually came from heaven. Once I realized, I repented. Because I needed to stop in my busyness. I needed to stop blaming people. I needed to stop criticizing churches. I needed to stop criticizing everybody around me. And re I realized I have problems of my own. I realized I needed a Savior. And I needed to stop right there on my tracks. Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So once I realized, once I repented, I returned. Therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Zacharias 1.3. I found out that not only am I returning to God, but God's going to return to me. And what would want, wh why would God want to return to me? Why would God want anything to do with me? Because he created me. He didn't create me so I could suffer, so I can die in my sins. He actually died so I don't have to die. He actually cares about me that much that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel I want to preach. That's the message I want to declare. This is God. This is God's son giving everything for you and I. Who didn't deserve it? In fact, we, we denied him so many times. And how, how many times do we need to deny the Lord? You know, if God, God calls us to be uh, a Christians, why do we deny such a great love? He's not pursuing us with punishment but he's pursuing us with righteousness, with deliverance. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Um, there's, there's just... There's this one, uh, one particular scripture that Isaiah was saying where people were denying him. And they weren't 
accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. And these were God's children. These were God's chosen nation. In Romans chapter 10, verse 20, Isaiah quoted this. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. God revealed himself to me. This is when I realized I needed a savior. But those religious folks, those people that know of God, but don't want to hear nothing about the power, don't want to hear nothing about speaking in tongues, or that's for, you know what, we're going to have church our way. Check this out. But in verse 21, he says to Israel, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. People have been running away from God. People have been denying the power of God. They want a church without God. And this is why Paul told Timothy, stay focused, preach the word. That is our job, to preach the word. So once I realized and I repented, then I returned. Then I reunited with God. When I gave, got saved, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day. He was, in other words, God was adding, adding to the church day by day. Because why? Because I was reunited. I was reunited to a church that was loving on God. When I came into the church, I didn't tell them what was wrong with it, what they needed, or I'm going to show up at my time or give them my opinions. Nothing like that. When I came to the church, I was plugged in and uh, just, to, just to be part of it. It was exciting, man. There was nothing else I wanted to do but just to be part of this. And the minute they called an outreach, I was for it, man. I was all about it. I want to do something like that. You know, when somebody tells me, hey, you want to preach on the bullhorn for the very first time, I think they thought I was going to be intimidated by it. But, man, I was inspired. I go, this is what I'm called to do. Once I reunited, God gave me the opportunity to be rebuilt, allow people in my life, which I never did before. If people were going to be in my life, man, there was a scheme behind me. I was so wicked, I was going to use them for the wrong reason. I was either going to borrow money that I wasn't going to pay back. I was going to just use them for my own benefit. But God gave me an opportunity to rebuild. And people came into my life to help me out. Paul told Timothy to preach the word, meaning to be a herald of good news. People need to hear the good news, not so that they can feel better, but that they could be better. The word, the good news, will bring liberty and will set the captive free. In Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, it says, How then will they call upon him whom they have not believed? Well, it's not no secret. <laughs> God's going to use you. Don't think about your neighbor. Don't think about, like, man, if my pastor was here, he'd tear it up. He'd, he'd knock it out of the park. No, God's going to use you. You know, and I appreciate anybody and everybody that tries to invite people to my church. But I'm asking you to be the church. You be the church. And you be out there. Spread it like wildfire. Have a spark. I mean, this thing can blow up, man, where people are just repenting daily. And if we can get to that point, man, I'm telling you, there's going to be a revival. You might not know what a revival is. Well, let's put it this way. People are, were dead, but now being alive again. But he goes on to say in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, he says, And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Right? Someone needs to preach. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, I want to throw in a little plug here about my church because I'm proud of my church. That word sent really meant something to me. Me and my wife didn't come up 
one day and just say, you know, hey, Maria, let's just, let's just start a church. Let's just do our own thing. We didn't do anything like that. I waited until I was approved, until I was ordained, until my pastor heard my calling. I told him, I go, Pastor, I'm ready to go. It was 2010. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Send me. He goes, oh, really? Where do you want to go? I go, I'm going to go to Nashville. You're going to send me anywhere? Send me to Nashville. I'm ready to go. They need, they need a church like ours out there. I feel calling. I went out there to visit. I'm, I was witnessing. You got to send me, Pastor. He goes, oh, man, we'll, we'll talk about it next year. All right, 2011, conference is getting close. And I go, Pastor, I'm ready to go. Just say the word. We're going to go. And he goes, yeah, yeah, man. Oh, man, you know, you're on my mind. We're going to send you. And throughout the years, you got to understand, I'm, I'm being preached to. And my pastor is motivating me. My pastor is preaching the word of God. And every year I want to go. I want to go. Little by little, 2013 comes. And I'm not getting sent out again. But he says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? I really believe that is what kept me obedient. That one scripture, I am not going to go on my own ability. I'm not going to go just because I said I got offended and said, Pastor, you're not sending me, so I'm going to go. No, I had to wait, and it was 2014. And I popped my head into my pastor's office. And I go, Pastor, today is July 21st. I know conference starts tomorrow, but I just want to let you know I've been serving you for nine years. And I had a little kind of arrogance, cockiness in my, in my approach. And I go po poke my head in there. I go, I just want to let you know we're not going because you're not sending us. And I just want to share that. And I walked out the door. And apparently that bothered my pastor so much where he calls me. Conference started that week. He calls me in his office. And he was like, he was on fire. He goes, I'm sending you. I go, when do you want to be announced? This Friday or next year? I go, I'm going to leave it up to you. And I'm like scared now. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, are you sure you want to send me? But that's the reality. That's my point is that I don't get up and go unless I hear my pastor hear from God. You know, and this is where we get offended. And this is where we, we're, we're not being taught the word of God properly. In order to, for you to preach about Jesus, you need to make sure that you're hearing God's voice and you're hearing your pastor's voice. Because of we went with the blessing of our pastor and he sent us out, I am not only going on my calling, but I'm going on uh, the support of my mother church. See, Paul understood what is needed and what his job was. Today, you will notice that there's, there's those things that the world would look at for into a church. In other words, they're looking for non-essential things, and they count that as important. Most church shoppers, and I run into a lot of them, like I, I, when I'm preaching to Jesus and I'm telling them about Jesus and uh, I'm encouraging them and saying, man, God has a plan for you. You know, I get a lot of people say, man, I'm looking for a church. I'm actually looking for a church. And it's like, man, I know, I know what that means. Nine out of ten times, they're not going to come to my church. Maybe, maybe it's just something that they say, but I don't know. But most church shoppers will look at churches at their parking lot. They'll look at, do you have a coffee shop? They'll look at, well, how's your children's ministry? Or what style of music do you guys do? What, what kind of programs do you have for feeding the homeless or feeding? They'll look at all these other things before they look at their biblical stance on sin or what is being preached. That's sad, guys. So what really counts and matters at the end of the day, guys, is the gospel being preached. All, the, all those other things are nice to have. That is not what is most important. And chances are, we may have taken off, we have may, may have taken our eyes off of preaching and put more focus on ministry. That's sad, guys. If you get to the point where you're serving in church and you're more you're more arguing about media, about 
uh, ministry, about music, if you're more worried about those things. He also gave him this instruction. Be ready in season and out of season, showing great care and perseverance. That's what it means. Make use of those seasons, which may seem convenient, but take advantage of opportunities when they arise. I'm talking both to the preacher and I'm talking both to the hearer. You know, we just we just seen an opportunity. We as a church, we invested in all this toilet paper. We went out and bought it and we reached our community because we seen that there was a need. We seen that we took advantage of it because for, so we can preach to them, so we could pray for them at the end of the day. Right? Whether they come back or not, we'll see. Maybe we'll get revival through this. It doesn't matter. We did our job, and we used toilet paper. The Bible tells us that God will use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He also said to reprove. In the New King James Version, uh, I believe it says convince. So reprove, meaning it's okay to disapprove. I remember there was a time where uh, I was invited constantly to go out to a bar just to hang out with a friend of mine. And it's not that... I mean, uh, it's not that I wanted to be argumentative or confrontational, but I tell him no over and over again. So he asked me, why won't I go out and just drink with him to this bar? It's a bar and grill. And I, I go, I had to explain to him. I had to take my time and teach him. I go, I'll go. At the end of the day, I'll go if my kids are invited. So we ended up going to this bar and grill in San, uh, uh, I believe, San Marino or some, something like that out there in uh, California. It was a nice area, but... What he's seen was me teach him, and as I'm teaching my kids, what we can do and what we can't do because I'm a Christian. It's okay for me to disagree with people. If they want to go out and drink, that's fine. I just won't be part of it, which is fine with me too. But at the end of the day, that same individual calls me up years later to tell me he's a Christian. I believe that teaching moment became a point where I just planted a seed. Maybe someone along came along and watered that seed. But I planted something there. He also said, hey, you got to take time to rebuke. You know, you can rebuke privately, some publicly. It all depends according to the nature, obviously. But sometimes God says, hey, you need to be confrontational. Paul was telling Peter, Paul was telling Timothy, I'm sorry, that you have to rebuke. But use the word of God and explain to them why you're rebuking them. He also says that you need to exhort. As you're preaching, you need to show some love, some good works, and hold fast to the profession of faith and walk as be becomes the gospel of Christ. In other words, and, to, and perseverance in faith and fellowship. With all, at the end of the day, and this is where we, I think we miss it sometimes as pastors, preach with long-suffering. Preach with patience. I believe that means if they don't get it, just like, just like God has always extended the arm to people, it's okay. You still have to preach. If they don't get it right away, maybe they still keep on falling asleep at your church. You still preach. One day they're going to get it. One day they're going to be so connected with the, uh, with what's going on in church, I encourage you guys, as pastors, as preachers, as soon-to-be pastors, that God has called you by the power of his message and the word of his testimony, by God's power. If you feel that this is calling is upon you, that's what's most important. Get connected to a church. If you don't have a church and you're close by, I'd love for you to come to my church. But if you do not have a church, I encourage you, find out what they're preaching, not what they're showing, not what they're showcasing. Who cares if uh, uh, popular Christians come in and play music for a while and so forth? Who cares? Are they preaching the word of God? That's what it really comes down to. Is life changing? Is, life, is there life in the church? I don't care about the music. Is there life? Is there a heartbeat? One that follows after Jesus. But if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to take this time in this moment 
and just extend an invitation to come to know who Jesus is. Maybe you're running away from God. Maybe uh, you knew Jesus at one time, and maybe you're just far away from him. I want you to just repeat this prayer after me. You say this prayer, you realize you need the Savior, but I'm asking you to repent. Just take this moment and stop. Have there be a change of mind. Have there be a change of position where you're no longer going to be partaking in those other things that pull you away from God. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you a sinner, and I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for every sin I've ever committed against you. God, the reality is I never knew that you loved me that much, that you would send your own son to die on the cross for my sin and resurrect on the third day. Jesus, today I give you my life and I thank you for being my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, just inbox me, just to give a shout out. Say, man, I said the prayer. Maybe you said it again. Maybe you're two timers. You're saying it over and over again. I said that three, three times, four times. That doesn't matter. You say it every day. Say it, man. I said the prayer. Write it on the text. Inbox us. And the other thing is, preachers, keep on preaching the word of God. We have a job to do. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Don't grow weary in well-doing. We love you guys. And just hear us out. Uh, my two sons are going to be coming up. One's going to be ministering with the song, listen to the words, while the other one closes it off.
So if you guys can, turn to Proverbs 3. We're going to read verse 9 and 10. So in verse 9 and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of every, everything you pr uh, produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats with, will overflow with good wine. So what, these, what this scripture really means to me, whenever I was reading, uh, I went to the story when Jesus fed uh, 5,000 men and their families. So how it says right here, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. Uh, produce. So this kid had five loaves of bread and two fish. And whenever he honored the Lord, whenever he gave that uh, to Jesus, what Jesus did was that he blessed it unto the heavens and he fed all the people. He fed all their pe all these people and their families. And this kid still got to leave with extra whenever Jesus had blessed it. So we see seen in verse 10, it says, Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. So when this kid, like I said, gave uh, Jesus what he had, uh, first Jesus fed everybody. He blessed it unto the heavens. And then this kid walked away with more than a blessing. So I, I say all this is because I, I we shouldn't limit God on our giving. And if you guys have been holding back, I, I want to challenge you to ask God what he wants you to give. And I mean, of course, give give with a cheerful heart, but don't don't limit God. Just put him up, like put him to the test and let him show you how great he is. So if you guys uh, if you guys can, if you guys do. You guys can give to us under our Venmo account under the Cure Church Nashville. That is, uh, that's how you, f you can find us. There's multiple Cure Churches, but uh, yeah, we're the Cure Church Nashville. So uh, before we close tonight or today, let me just close off in prayer. So Father God, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for what you've done in uh, this place, Lord. And during this time, Lord, I just thank you for your protection, Lord. I just pray right now, Lord, that whoever gives, Lord, that you may that you may bless them, Lord, and bless them in ways that they need to be blessed, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. So if you guys can, tune in to Wednesday night service. It's going to be me and Chris preaching the word. So tune in. Thank you for joining.